Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So there are ways to get into agriculture that do not necessarily look like this. There are farms and yards, farms and closets and buildings, things that aren't really farms per se, but that help assist farms like my own. And so in this video, I wanted to broaden the scope a little bit on what a small farm or micro farm could be. And I'll also touch on a topic that I frankly do not think gets enough attention or for that matter appreciation as an idea, part-time farming. So let's do it. First thing, the difference between farming and say homesteading or whatever is that one of them is a business and as such needs to be treated like a business to survive. But I've kind of already done that video. In this one, we're just gonna do the fun part and talk about what those ag or farm businesses are. But I wanted to start there on that business point because if you do like one of these ideas and think it could work for you in your context, you're going to have to go through the whole business starting process, market research, business plan, etc. No way around it. Believe me, I've tried. You will genuinely hardly find a more reluctant entrepreneur than myself. But if you plan to spend money on things that you want to sell, you have to get serious about it. Otherwise, your farm or farm adjacent business just won't last. All right, so let's start with some of the peripheral agricultural businesses that could help farms like my own because I'm selfish, but I'm also honest. First, we need more good, conscientious composters. So much so that we built a whole podcast with Jane Murner around this exact idea. The idea here is that we need folks not only making good compost, but who are also willing to care about the stream of materials that they are processing to keep out potential contaminants like persistent herbicides or plastics, etc. Then they can turn that into varying products from mulching compost to really high quality nutritional composts and potting mixes. And if you're interested or, well, confused maybe, I do discuss the four types of compost in the Living Soil Handbook, which when you get it from notillgrowers.com helps support these videos. Just saying. An unrelenting amount of good organic materials get thrown into landfills and with more people processing that material, less of it will get wasted because the only food that is ever truly wasted is that which does not get turned into more food. But of course, composting can take up a lot of land. So maybe scaling it, composting, on a small scale could mean something like starting a worm farm instead, which can be done in enclosed areas or outdoors in drier, warmer regions. The castings can be sold. Uh, the worms can be sold or both. I'll make sure to add a few links in the show notes if you want to follow up on one idea or another. Uh, black soldier fly larva is also in the mix and or other insects for chicken feed or lizard feed. I recently learned of a farm that just raises tobacco worms to feed invertebrates, amphibians and reptiles and that sort of thing and makes really good money doing it and it just kind of blew my mind. I mean, I, I, I try not to raise tobacco worms on my farm, honestly. But as they say, there are riches in the niches. I personally always wanted to run a snail farm for escargot, but fearing I would be my only customer, I did back off of that idea. That said, if you love the idea of livestock and don't have the space for cattle or sheep or goats or whatever, just go with smaller livestock, right? The one challenge with growing bugs and insects is that the conditions have to be pretty spot on, especially if you take them indoors. That's humidity, temperature, light, all of it has to be dialed in. But for a certain brain and a certain budget, that might be fun. And in some cases, jobs like these might be great for those who struggle with mobility, like I probably will in the future at some point in my life, right before I start my snail farm. Something else that can be done indoors or in very shady areas is mushroom farming. For years, we grew shiitakes and oysters on logs out in a largely cedar forest. Uh, where not much else would grow. Um, you can also grow them indoors in bags. Things like shiitake logs can be a casual addition to your business or just a business on their own in the right market. Like with any biological product, as soon as you take those indoors though, you have to do all the things that nature does for you outside, providing humidity and temperature control, etc. Outdoors, a lot of that stuff is out of your control. So in terms of a business, you have to find the balance that meets your needs or maybe you just fits your climate. For instance, I would love to grow fruit here in Kentucky zone 6B, but we just get too much rain and humidity for the majority of fruit, or we get too cold for things like peaches or citrus to do well enough to do that on a production scale. While I'm on this topic though, we should shout out a recent episode of the, the No-Till Market Garden podcast with host Mimi Castile and guest Tim Phillips of Charlie Herring Wines, where they discuss the value of small vineyards, really like micro vineyards, 
So in, if winemaking or cider making is your thing, maybe you don't need as much space as you think. Go give that episode a listen. It's wonderful. Okay, back to the mushrooms for a second. There can be many products sold through mushroom farming from the fruit itself, obviously, but also the logs or blocks. Uh, mushroom products like dried mushrooms or maybe medicinal tinctures with species like reishi mushrooms, all of that could be done in a very small area. Moreover, as a bonus, the waste of mushroom production can be turned into a nice mulch or compost if done right. In the woods, there are also options like woodland flowers or woodland medicinals like ginseng or black cohosh uh, that can be produced. Pigs and other livestock are a fan of the woods as well, though it's nice for them to have more of a savanna area where they can munch on grasses and forbs and also the nuts from trees and that sort of thing. And I don't really plan to discuss livestock in this video because the amount of land most livestock require, but I bring up woodland livestock because for many of us, woods may be all we have access to financially. There's just not much available in the way of reasonably priced arable land or pasture uh, at this moment and probably in any moment in the future. But the woods can be rich with opportunity if managed well, from livestock to plants to mushrooms to nuts and maple or other tree saps. And shout out to these guys for sending me this maple syrup the other day. That was really amazing. I know personally, very much so in the summer, I would much rather work in the woods. I should also add here, if there are things I miss or ideas that you have that could be done on a small scale, put those ideas in the comment section for others. Because the one thing about farms and agriculture is that the possibilities are pretty much overwhelming. What you can do with a piece of land is almost infinite. But like I talk about in this recent video, your context should determine at least some of what you do. In the spirit of overwhelming possibility though, let's throw a few more ideas into the mix of how you could be involved in agriculture. Well, what about veggie farming? That seems like an obvious one. Well, indeed it can be done on a very small scale. Backyards and urban farms with the addition of things like microgreens, those operations can be quite profitable. I mean, growing veggies is kind of what this channel does, so I don't probably need to elaborate too much more on that. But I just wanted to note that because small farms like mine are also an option, even if you only have an acre or a half acre or a quarter acre and even an eighth of an acre, you could do a lot of food on a small amount of space. Flower farming too, that's a great option on a very small scale. And I'll link some folks like Jenny Love of No Till Flowers and Bear Mountain Farm to follow for guidance on that in the show notes. I love them. Another somewhat related idea is that more and better organic nurseries could be helpful, both for plant starts and for things like native plants and fruit trees and that sort of stuff for like hedgerows. Now those require uh, some extensive know-how and some well-designed infrastructure and definitely a love of spreadsheets. But if you can zero in on a few high demand crops and do them really well, there's a market for it. I think of slow or difficult crops like grafted tomatoes. If you have a lot of small growers in the area and you get good at producing niche starts like those, there might be a really good market for you. Another way to involve yourself is to make the most out of the sheer amount of waste that occurs uh, at farmers markets and small farms. Here in Kentucky, we have a nonprofit gleaning group that comes by at the end of the market and on Sundays and takes that excess produce that might otherwise go into waste and turns it into other products. When I go to the West Coast and see the amount of fruit on trees in people's yards, I think a whole business could be built around, and certainly they exist, but a whole business could be built around managing those trees and selling or distributing that fruit. Now, any of those things I mentioned could be made profitable on the right scale and with the right startup capital and proper investments, business plan, and so on. I know it's the boring stuff, but it's like, it's like trying to have a body without like a heart and brain and all the things. That's a terrible analogy. I'm keeping it. However, and here's where I get into perhaps the more controversial part of this video, not all farms and maybe very few farms need to be a family's sole income. In fact, I would argue that most farms can or possibly should just be part-time gigs anyway. Hear me out. According to the USDA, 96% of farms have off-farm income, which is a little misleading because 29% of that is things like, quote, interest, dividends, private pensions, social security payments, uh, veterans benefits, and payments from other public programs. So not just outside jobs exactly, but outside income. But still, that means the other 71% of off-farm income is made up largely of off-farm jobs. And there seems to be an inherent assumption in this that these farms aren't making enough to survive, which may be true and certainly is true for some, but it also may be true that these farmers are just smart 
and know that dealing with the elements, dealing with nature and her unpredictability is an inherently risky bet. And so having some amount of diversified income is a great idea. It's easy to jump to the conclusion that these farmers don't know what they're doing, which I think is rooted in this idea that farmers are not educated folks, but the reality may be that they are doing the absolute most logical thing that most other people do in the world. They're just playing it safe. They have a side hustle. They have another thing that they enjoy doing or are good at and, want to, and can do it professionally. I have lived in rural communities for the majority of my 30, 11 years, and the farm owners I know are generally pretty savvy business people by and large. They think thoughtfully about their businesses and their livelihoods, as I think anyone who is hoping to get into this farming thing should. This is not an easy business. Actually, no, scratch that. This is a ludicrous thing to rely on for your living, to put all of your eggs in a proverbial basket that could flood or dry up or both within a month of each other, a basket that could blow away, burn up, or just die for no obvious reason. To quote my buddy Josh Satin, there ain't no harm in part-time farming. Especially when you are just starting out, there is no reason to sell everything, quit your job, and move to the country to start a farm. Most farmers don't even do that. That isn't to discourage anyone from starting a fully financially stable farm business. Not at all. It is entirely possible. Rather, if I have a goal, it's to encourage people to see that it doesn't have to be the only thing you do. You don't have to go all in at first. In some situations, a small part-time farm might be better anyway. It's physically challenging of a job and can be emotionally and financially expensive to start. There may not be enough of a market yet to sustain your products. Yet being the operative word, you may have to work on that, work on building it. There are ways to do this, to farm and have jobs in farming and create farming and help other farmers that make sense on a small scale. You can always scale it up or find partners to reduce your personal risk or add different enterprises. It doesn't have to be part-time or stay part-time, but I just want you to know it also doesn't have to be full-time. Definitely not right away. The only thing I will add, and I want to do so emphatically, is that if you do start a small part-time farm business like those I mentioned, or like my vegetable business or whatever, please just don't undercut those who are heavily reliant on the food they produce for an income. One, that's just not cool. And two, that won't help you or help them or help the customer in the end as it will adjust their expectations to something that's unreasonable or unsustainable for a business. Otherwise, I do want to encourage anyone and everyone who has willingly watched this far to get their hands into agriculture in one way or another. A small farm business, a garden, a flock of laying hens, a pile of shiitake logs. Oof, there's a sentence that could have gone sideways pretty fast. Whatever interests you and makes sense should be on the table. I will leave it at that. Please feel free to put your ideas in the comments section. If you appreciate that I take the time to make these videos, sometimes literally tripling the amount of time it takes me to do a certain task like plant spinach, so just so that I can film it and sometimes refilm it or film it from different angles, consider supporting our work by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com or a hat or other merch or become a Patreon member at patreon.com slash notillgrowers or just hit that super thanks button. That works too. There are also uh, some on-farm no-till field days coming up here at Rough Draft Farmstead if you want to check those out. Links for all that in the show notes. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.